Raised in a homeschool environment by parents with a Reconstructionist vision, Luke claims Christian Reconstruction as the mindset and mission of his faith. He is the author of The Sound Doctrine of Theocracy and currently serves as the president of the board for Future of Christendom. He currently lives in Berks County with his wife. It's time to take a look at Christian nationalism. Like a bird's eye view kind of a thing. Where we started, where it's going, you know, how it started, how, how it is, how it's going now. It's time to take a look. Let me preface this by saying, several years ago, there were many people who were involved in Christian Reconstruction who were leaders in the movement, who got into the movement by saying things that were, they were very uh, enlightening, they were very informative, they were very uh, beneficial to the movement. These were smart people. And then as time got, uh, went on, it turned out they were not pro-Bible, which the, the goal and the, the desire of Christian Reconstruction is to be pro-Bible. Turns out these people were not pro-Bible, they were just anti-conservative. And their desire to be anti-conservative at the time had pushed them into Reconstruction because I guess the conservatives at the time were saying, you can't legislate morality or something like that. And that caused these people to be like, oh, hold on a second, you can legislate morality, we're Reconstructionists now, we're gonna take that vision. And those people today, generally speaking, are Marxists, feminists, anarchists, and homosexuals. The leaders of Reconstruction just a few years ago, not the leaders, I should say, many of the leaders, they turned out to be frauds. And they turned out to be frauds because they were not pro-Bible. They were anti-conservative. And whatever that meant at the time, that's what they were going to do. So if the conservatives said, we need closed borders, they would say, oh, we need open borders. If the conservatives said, the man should be the leader of the household, they said, no. They, didn't, they wouldn't come out and say the woman should be the leader of the household, but that was the cash value of what they were saying. But they revealed themselves to be frauds. My concern for Christian nationalism right now, the direction that it's going, there's a split coming, if it hasn't happened already. My concern for Christian nationalism is that it's not pro-Bible, it's just anti-liberal. And whatever that means, that's what we're gonna do. If the liberals say open borders, we say close borders. If the liberals say the female should be the head of the house, we say the male should be the head of the house. Now that's true, I, be I believe that. But I am very concerned that the leaders of Christian nationalism or a sect or a section, maybe the, the biggest section of Christian nationalism is not pro-Bible, it's becoming just anti-liberal. And we're getting our cues from people who hate Christ and just saying the opposite of whatever, because they must be wrong about everything, right? I'm gonna talk about Christ being the king of the nation, what does that look like, and I'm gonna take a look at what the Christian nationalists are saying. Now, I'm gonna start off by saying things like, there's some agreement in, the two, in some camps of Christian nationalism. The basic agreement is we are Christian nationalists and we want a Christian nation. We are Christian nationalists and we think Christ is king of this nation. And we are Christian nationalists and we think and we, we, we can and we should serve him as a nation. That's basically what most Christian nationalists agree on. Those three things. Now I'm going to ask you this question right here. Do you hear this coming from Christian nationalism? as a whole, as like a, the, the main thrust, like this message, you walk into the Christian nationalist room and here's what they're all saying. Let's test it out. We're Christian nationalists and to the law and the testimony, if they be not of these, there's no light in them. Does that sound familiar to you? How about this? We're Christian nationalists and we believe God's law is the answer to all of society's issues. Is that what the Christian nationalists are saying? How about this? 
We're Christian nationalists, and sacred scripture is foundational for society, and the church fathers' tradition and heritage are not foundational. Is that the message we're getting from Christian nationalism right now? Is that what we're saying? How about this? We're Christian nationalism, and God's law informs and is superior to natural law. Sound familiar? I guess not. I'll tell you, it doesn't sound familiar to me when I, when I peek my head in the Christian nationalism room. We're Christian nationalists, and God's law orders society. How about this one? We are Christian nationalists, and we need to deport all immigrants and get more prisons. Does that sound familiar to you? We're Christian nationalists, and we need another crusade. I'll tell you, these are a little more, these are a little more familiar to me. Now we're starting to get into familiar territory with these. How about this one? We need, we're Christian nationalists, and we need a pr Christian prince to clean house. We're Christian nationalists, and we need a Christian prince to order us. That's what we need around here. We need someone to order us. Someone. Uh-oh. We're Christian nationalists and the Jews are the real problem. Now, now let, let me just say to you real quick, I'm not saying that these things are all wrong. But if we are Christian nationalists and we want a Christian nation, this cannot be our platform. It can't be our platform. We cannot be saying things like, we are Christian nationalists and thus say Aquinas. We can't be saying things like, we are Christian nationalists, and thus say, insert 16th century, 17th century reformer right here. That can't be our foundation. Please, please tell me it's not our foundation as Christian nationalists. And here, how about this one? Thus saith natural law. That's got to be our foundation. We are Christian nationalists, and thus saith the Lord. Is that what you're hearing from Christian nationalism right now? Is that what they're saying? I'm a Christian nationalist, and by the way, thus saith the Lord. There's two different camps here that's, that appear to be, that appear to be uh, showing themselves. One has an emphasis on peace and order in the nation. That's one branch of Christian nationalism. They want peace and order in the nation. And then there's another branch that says, we want justice and righteousness in the nation. And unfortunately, the two are becoming very different camps. Now, you might think, this, isn't that the same thing? No, 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 it's not. It's not the same thing. One is a product and one is a foundation. Now, there's some works on Christian nationalism that have been done by Doug Wilson, Andrew Isker, uh, Andrew Torba, and Stephen Wolf. I'm going to be taking a look at the case for Christian nationalism, and I'm going to be sharing some quotes from you from this book, because this is where I'm, I'm getting my concern. I want, to, I want to just not get up here and say a bunch of things and poke a bunch of holes in the air with my finger without showing you what the people who are Christian nationalists are saying in their works. This is the case for Christian nationalism. This is, uh, uh, can't impress what they have to say about Stephen Wolf's book, case for Christian nationalism. Stephen Wolf offers a tour de force argument for the good of Christian nationalism. It's from Canon Press, right? Obviously, it was made by Canon Press. Oh, yeah, distributed by Canon, Canon Press, written by Stephen Wolf. I'm going to share with you some quotes just to let you know, okay, this is where we're going in Christian nationalism, a certain branch. Civil law, this is quotes from the book of, of uh, a case for Christian nationalism. Civil law orders a civil society according to the reason of the lawgiver. Natural law rights are a means to man's good, but not ends in themselves. And I want you to listen very carefully to this next sentence. Hence, they can be suspended, but only with extreme caution and wisdom. Did you hear that? Is this the book that we're handing out to people? Like, hey, you want to hear about Christian nationalism? Here, take this book, read it. And it's saying things like this in there. We can suspend our natural rights if we're very careful about it, I promise I'll give them back. 
We're, we're flirting with these ideas like, like, like from some ivory tower somewhere. We're playing with people's lives. How about this one? The magistrate enacts and enforces law by his own design. A sort of vicar of divine civil rule. And, 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 and you want to be reformers? And we're using this word, vicar! Another, some more quotes. A law is just only if it has the common good in view. I don't know about you, but I've heard the common good a lot throughout my lifetime. And let me tell you, it is a blank check that means something different to everyone. The common good in view? Can you tell me any bill that has been passed in American history that did not have the common view in good? Strike that. Reverse it. The common good in view. Is this the book we're handing out to people? Here you go. Here's Christian nationalism. Educate yourself. We can suspend rights if we're very careful about it. The Christian prince mediates the people's national will for their good, providing them the specific and necessary actions to that end. Play, play it out, please. Just, just for a second, play it out. Some knucklehead becomes the Christian prince of this nation. He orders it to society, specifically tells us how to be ordered. He dies, and some other guy gets up there, and now we have to really learn society all over again. Is this a good idea? Are we dealing with Christian nationalism or Christian statism? Is this the book we're giving to people? And it turns out, yeah, this is the book we're handing around. We're flirting with these ideas. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, maybe it is a good idea. Maybe, maybe we just get some sort of Christian dictator up there. That'll teach those liberals. A policy that is righteous in, in itself may not be good in its effect, and civil leaders must enact good policies. Sometimes the right thing to do is not the right thing to do. So who cares if it's actually the right thing to do? It just, it just might not have a good result. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm kind of thinking about like what Bible verse you would extract that idea from. How could you read the Bible and conclude that ah, sometimes the right thing to do is not the right thing to do? Oh, we've got to be smart. We've got to be careful. Yeah, and I know that you want the, 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 the biblical and the righteous thing to do, but that's just not the good idea right now. We're not ready for it. And this is the book we're giving to people. How about this one? Being ministers of a spiritual kingdom, pastors cannot depose the prince, i.e. strip him of formal authority, nor can ministers absolve the people from their oath to the prince. I don't know what oath we're taking to the prince. This, this is a little new to me. Nor as ministers can they lead or command a revolt against him, even if the prince errs in his judgment concerning morals and ecclesiastical things. Now, I understand what he's saying here, context of this. Just you know, the pastors are not in control of the prince. They're, they're, the pastors, the ecclesiastical authorities can't just be like, okay, let's get together. We're going to elect a new prin uh, prince or whatever. They, they're not in control of him. But let me tell you something. The way this is worded, this is not how we got the war for independence. I, I submit to you that whoever wrote this, if he was handing this out in Boston, 1775, he would have been tarred and feathered. So, so we, we, we put a bunch of smart people in a room. We say, hey, we want, some, we want some philosophical bulwark for Christian nationalism. They come out of the room and they say, okay. And we say, what do you got? And they say, okay, picture this. George III again. George III again? Well, yeah, everything that, I, uh, everything that I've, I've showed you here is what George III was doing. At best case scenario, we get George III. In all probability, we'll get the Pope again. You think I'm joking? How about this one? A prince may require the elevation of the pulpit above the Lord's table in church construction, for example. This follows a natural prince of order. So the, the prince not only is giving the specific ends, he's coming into your church telling you where to put your pulpit. You want to tell me all that? No, the Pope never did that. This is the book we're giving to people. 
In other words, the magistrate punishes for the violation of not failing to worship in itself, but because the failure to attend violates a fundamental norm of Christian civil community. Here he's talking about uh, mandatory church attendance. We fought a violent and bloody revolution. Excuse me, the French did that. We fought a violent and bloody war for independence. And we came together and we swore in our wrath Never again will we give someone this much power and authority over the people of this nation and hear the Christian nationalists come together and we're speculating, man, let's do it again. How can you be pro-American and be saying these things? As, as critical as I am and have been on this stage about the founding fathers and what they said and what they did, they at least took a step in the right direction. And now, and now there's a sect of Christian nationalists. Let's go back and do that again. What have we learned? The foundation of the book is, uh, the first is that I assume the Reformed theological tradition, so I make a little effort to exegete biblical text. Okay. I think we all knew that from reading those quotes. But since I pull mainly from the 16th and 17th centuries in which Reformed theology was very Thomistic and Catholic, many of my theological premises are widely shared among Christians. Furthermore, when I cite non-Protestants or pre-Reformation theologians, e.g. Thomas Aquinas, I'm not opposing or correcting the Reformed Protestantism, but, the rec but recognizing and pulling directly from the Catholic sources in the Reformed tradition. Now, this is a quote from the book. This is the foundation, uh, the foundation of the introduction of the book. So, so... This, this idea of, okay, to be truly reformed, and that's the thrust of many Christian nationalists right now. We, we, we have the reformers on our side. Do you see that? To be truly reformed is to go back to the Catholics again. Does anyone think that's a good idea? Does anyone think that's a historical idea? Let's do Catholicism again. We're pulling from their sources and building books on it. Next slide, please. Let me uh, give a message to the uh, uh, Christian nationalists. Colossians 2.8, a message for Christian nationalism. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. We don't build a nation off of human tradition. That's not smart. That's not wise, and most importantly, I know it's not cool, I know it's not sexy, it's not biblical. And here we are with a whole movement flirting with the idea of let's build a whole nation off of a tradition that smacks of popery, George III, and the moral majority. What unifies us as Christian nationalists? What is our foundation and what is our goal? Let justice roll down like waters. Our goal should be to establish justice because we're not getting the tradition, we're not getting the heritage unless we have justice in the land. What about this Christian prince, Job? What about him? When I went to the gates of the city where I prepared my seat in the square, the young men saw me and withdrew, the aged rose and stood. The princes refrained from talking and laid their hands on their mouth. Because I deliver the poor who cried for help and the fatherless who had none to help him. Men listened to me and waited and kept silent for my counsel. And I spoke. They did not speak again. They waited for me as the rain. What was he doing? Was he out there pat making up law? Was he out there saying things like, here's my new hot take on how justice and society should be ordered? No. He sat his fat butt down at the gates People came to him, and he gave them justice from God's law, and that was the result. My friends, Christ is king of the nation. Our desire is to see justice and righteousness established because we will not have any of those other good things that the Christian nationalists want unless we have justice and righteousness established in the nation. That should be our goal. Thank you.